So a little bit of revision because of the schedule. When I taught this class before, it was online, and then when it went hybrid, we were meeting like two days a week. So one day I would do the lecture, and then another day I would do the lab. So a little difference in in the schedule now that you're only having one session because of the holiday. So instead of assigning you the assignment and not have the lecture, um, I decided that we I moved everything to one week so that way we can see the concept applied in our lab exercise. So the lab that you're doing today is a new lab that I wrote, um, kind of based on some of the exercises I've done in the past. You see it again when you do the server component for administration and package management. Um, many of my students started in this new doing this part of, of their task is you know, to create user accounts, to do inventory of accounts, to be able to make sure that everybody has the right group membership. So it'll start with some of the tasks that you will see today. Um, later on, when we have a break, make sure that you grab a drive from the chair for the lab if you haven't, okay? So today we're gonna talk about one of my favorite topics, which is gonna be access management. Um, access management is essential in cybersecurity. Everything starts with access. If you're if you are managing your resource and how it's accessed properly, a lot of times you don't face as many issues. You have other areas that you have to look at as well. But when we're looking at Internet of Things, that's important, right? And we're looking at users, that's important. Um, a lot of automated systems now, right? Um, you know, even the systems that are creating the user account could be automated. So you have to really take a look at how the subject is accessing the object, which is what we see as access, right? The definition for access. So there are a few components that you're gonna have to remember for the certifications. Um, before we used to call it the triple A, but now they call it the quadruple A. But the triple A really represents, right, uh, uh, authentication, authorization, and accounting. But the most first thing that you need to do is to identify the subject or your user. The user doesn't automatically appear in the system, right? You can either have the user self-register, like how you sign up for an account online um, for some kind of service, or you have to manually create the user, which is what we're gonna be doing today. So once we identify the user by creating the user, we are gonna set up some form of authentication. And authentication is to, to really validate who they are. So if I'm Casey Nguyen and I'm logging into our CCD system, just like how you are logging into your school account, um, you, you are, when you issue in that password, a few things happen in the back, right? We know that we need to validate ourselves, but how does it know what kind of access do you have, okay? It uses a security token, which is granted from the server. So when I'm issuing my password to the system, that credential is then sent across the network. And it, it reaches the authentication server and it's gonna match up the information for that entity, right? That particular subject. And once that match up, the token is then gonna be released and it's gonna be given to your account at that local temporary system at that moment, okay? For that period that you access the system. So with that token, it contains what? your privilege and your permission. In Windows environment, we call that user rights and permissions, right? Permission pertain to what kind of files and folders and drive you can access on the system and across the network. And privilege is what kind of things you can do on that system, the activity you can, you can initiate on that system. So meaning what? I can shut down the computer, yes. Right, I can restart the computer, yes, as a user here, but it might not be different in, in a different organization. So credential is a way that we would claim that we are who we are, right? 
And with that, we would need to issue some kind of verification using passwords, biometrics, and so on. So we'll talk about the factors. So to answer the questions on your assignment, um, the triple A stands for authentication. We touch on that. So whenever, you know, you guys all grew up with computer systems, right, the majority, um, and we all understood how to authenticate, right? You log into something, you would give it some kind of validation for who you are. So once if you validate that I am who I am, um, you would then be authorized to access at a particular level. As we mentioned that we would have privilege and we, are, we might be privileged to a certain area of the system or certain parts of the system. And then we are permitted for certain to access certain files and folders or drives or objects within that particular system and across the network. Accounting really entails making sure that it's logging and recording all the activities for that particular user once the user is authorized to do something. So today you're going to see that in Event Viewer, Windows use events to be able to track. For example, um, I get home, right? I would turn on my computer from the time that the computer boots to the time that you access the system, your computer tracks everything that's happening, okay? So today, when we create the user accounts and group, you're gonna see that it's gonna have a way to account for the objects that you create and the subject that you have in the, in the particular system. So in security, this is very important for us, not just authorizing, not just authenticating, but the accounting piece. Accounting is going to allow us to go back and detect behaviors or critical issues that we have to fix. So, for example, I have somebody brute forcing the password, meaning that they keep trying wrong password many, many times. The system is going to report that as failed events, right? Where if someone knew the password, they would issue the right password and access it immediately one try, that would be a success event. Okay. So we're going to see that in the lab today when we go through the exercise. So the authentication factors, we most of us know how to use passwords. This is something that would pertain to your knowledge. A PIN number, if you have an ATM card, um, or you would use a pin to access specific things. Like at work, you might have to scan your card and put in a pin to access doors. Now, password and pin really pertain to the knowledge of the user. Um, that is kind of limited because group forcing password just requires time and resource, right? If you have a powerful system, you will be able to get through. Pin numbers is actually really easy, right? We're looking at the combination of a four or a five digit pin from zero to nine, right? If you have ever taken CIS seven, we talk about convertorics for computer science. So in variation, we would see, you know, so when we they brute force, usually they're just trying to match up, right? The 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 characters based on you know, four or five digit or even eight or 12 characters. And sometimes people use common passwords or dictionary based type of word, right? Like if I'm using puppy, for example, in my password, it should be able to detect it. If, I'm, if I have a word list that is can be used for the dictionary attack. So something you know, Something you are, that's really the characteristic, the biological, right, factor for ourselves that would make us unique. So fingerprint, the, the percentage of match for that is very low, even on twins, right, or family members, okay? We all have different ridges. So whenever you see the curve on your, on your fingers, those are ridges. 
and they are going to be very unique to you because of your DNA, right? Um, the, the, it's very, 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 very low that you would naturally put someone on someone else in the world. I'm sure you guys seen tutorial video, documentary videos on how people duplicate fingerprint lines. What do they do? So the spy movie, they tell you to hold the glass, to capture your fingerprint on glass, yes, but to lift it, what do you do? Tape, but tape sometimes can be difficult to transfer or read, right? You need something malleable. This one is a little bit more difficult to access, right? So something that's accessible. Well, well, clay is clay depends on how malleable it is. Wax, right? So a lot of people use this like uh, a certain type of e wax or wax. And what they can do is they can lift it. Um, but you know, it's it's more of a craft, not everybody can do it, right? So in the physical attack, sometimes that you can lift the fingerprint. So biometrics, um, so your face, facial recognition is big nowadays, especially to log into your OS. So is it really looking at your picture, the entire face, right? It's doing measurement on how wide your, your face is, how far apart is your eye, are your eyebrows with the top of with your hairline. Um, so the computer, everything is mapped, right? It's doing measurement. So the first time that it creates a template, you guys have gone through that with your smartphone, or maybe other systems, right? Um, it will ask you to put your fingerprint in there or take a picture multiple times. Because in the case that if you wear your glasses, if you take off your glasses, it's doing the proper measurement so that what, even if you wear glasses, your, your face is still that wide, right? Um, even if you have the haircut, it's still able to detect, right? The, the, the ridges your know, between your nose and your mouth, and then how wide are your cheeks, and how wide is your face, and how long is your face. So all of that is going to go into some kind of calculation for the algorithm, and that's what it's saying. So wherever you press the fingerprint, the computer just match up that value of your fingerprint. It doesn't really, you know, recapture the image and then calculate again, right? It computes based on that particular template that you created compared to what you provide, right? So the whole point is the responsiveness in biometrics. So you guys know what gait is, right? How you walk or move? This is really good for like national security a lot of the time that can be used to detect like certain type of threat. So gait, something you have, um, normally now we have our smartphone using multi-factor authentication. So you wanna combine some of these together, right? A smart card, email, and then something you do could be swiping the screen. I think most of us have lock screen on our smart device, uh, like smartphone or tablet. And then where, somewhere you are, GPS location, and then something you exhibit to show your ID with biometrics. And then you always wanna use multi-factor. Now, multi-factor can be jeopardized, right? A lot of times people would have a, a false number or they would try to use your number. Um, they would use your email address and that's how they can have false identity and become to you. Any question? So make sure we know the multi-factor for our certification and this class for final exam. Okay, so I gave a little bit of breakdown of all of this. You can find some information. Um, now, sometimes you would have a one-time generated uh, password for a token, which is like a little device that you would use to scan the door. And then in order to enter the door, you have to also enter a password. A lot of companies use that for computer access, um, using something you have, something you know, with, you know, for different type of access. So you would use a one-time uh, or a 
one-time password. And we see this when they text you the pass, the, the op code, right? To be able to validate that you you have the device or you have the email address and so on when it sends you that message. Okay. So to really tie this back to how the the code is generated, a lot of the times authentication code is really it's hash based. We talked about hash before. It's just a value that's generated for some type of functionality. So the hash function can be using different type of cryptography. Um, for the one-time password base, like the one that would use for 30 seconds or five minutes that they send to you, a lot of the times it is randomly generated and it would send to a number that you would use to register. Now, all I need is to, as an attacker, I just need that that receiving device or the email address, right? Okay, so talk a, a lot about that. And then sometime, a lot of the time they would use time base. So it would expire after 30 seconds or 10 minutes and so on. So as an administrator, you can set that, right? You can set it on how long it's gonna live and it really depends on the window. A lot of time people reset password, they just need a few minutes, um, give or take. But you also have to consider like how well they are with technology. Not everybody is at the same pace. Um, are they able to access network connection and so on? So you wanna give it like a, a proper amount of time. Some company, right, they would give it a couple minutes, sometime longer. Any question? Okay. So I think a few years ago, we really emphasized the dual factor and that's the base minimal now, right? You have to have at least two elements in authentication. Now you, you know, your password needs to be longer and so on. But a lot of the times we, it's always good to implement multi-factor more than two, okay? Because a lot, we face some of the common issues in in just, you know, just the, the flaw in design, I think. So let's talk about number three. Mickey received a one-time password that expires in 60 seconds to access this account for password reset. What type of password does Mickey receive? And we know it is time based because it prints out after 60 seconds. And the, the acronym for that is T O T P, right? In this industry, hi, you have to remember the acronym. You might want to grab a drive for a lab later. So the operating system, the modern operating system, all OSs store your password in an encrypted format. Back in the days, your password used to be in clear text and it would be stored in a location where a user could find it, right? So your password is being protected by encryption. Now, when we refer to an application that uses password vault like pass, um, or, you know, you might use Apple products or I use the Samsung product because I have Samsung smartphone and devices at home. Um, so Password Vault is just a location where you would store all your passwords. It saves it there. And then whenever that you would use a certain type of web app or website, right, it plugs it in for you. The downfall in that is that the company that, that, offers that type of service if they get breached, which they are, right? Um, there's nobody who's not prone to breaches, then their user would be jeopardized as well. So Password Vault, the convenience behind it, right? Um, helping the user, ease of use, and so on is definitely, definitely uh, the, the benefit, the advantage. But the downfall in that is if that particular product is jeopardized or being hacked, then all the users are using that product. 
So if you attended some of the events that we hosted, so we know what called hosted that last semester, uh, we did a few things where we, uh, we saw the FBI agent who talked about how he also used some kind of product for practice. Because sometimes it's hard to remember a hundred different types of practices throughout your daily life. So, um, and, and even with that, the product that he, he chose is also not that secure. So for question five, it says, Charles used his fingerprint recognition system to log into his laptop that matches one out of four tries. He is rejected three out of four tries. What is the efficacy rate of the system? So we have to take a look at how, you know, the percentage of it being accepted and the rejection rate. It gives you here statistically it's 25%. So one divided by four gives you 25% for the true acceptance rate. The false rejection rate, it fails. So if it accepts one out of four, that means that it fails three out of four. So would you use this technology? In my opinion, it is the false acceptance rate is too high. So when you select your biometric technology, you gotta make sure that you look at their research and their, their, their production information on the fault acceptance and the true acceptance rate. Not all products are created equal, right? Some products are more responsive than the others. Some are more accurate than the others. We also, so the true acceptance rate. So that means that when Charles scans, four times, only one time he's able to get in, right? Would that frustrate you? I would be, right? One out of four. The other three times, right, he's still waiting. So it's like, you know, and the same thing with people don't remember password, right? They might have attempted four or five times and one time they didn't get in because password might, might, might have been forgotten. So it really depends on what will be acceptable for your organization, but in my opinion, this is high. So you want it to be at least 50% or better. So what is, where is the password vault with information on the notes? Did I not put it on there? Let me see. Okay. Yeah. It's true. Okay. So here it talks about two types of knowledge-based authentication, KVA. Some of the things that you're getting from certification is understanding what that terminology means, right? And then sometimes they would ask you certain things that would relate to a certain acronym. So your static knowledge base for authentication is just identifying password that's forgotten by the user. So when you click forgot password, and then it asks you for your user account and all of that, that's static base. For um, dynamic KBA, if you ever go to a website that will tell you you don't need to log in to pay for the bill, right? They're actually using dynamic knowledge base because you don't need to identify the actual username and password and validate that particular account. Um, sometimes they just need you to put in your first and last name and then maybe a little bit of your credit card account information. Um, or they might ask you some questions. So that's more dynamic based. I think a lot of companies is moving this route. Why is that? And they assess the risk in that, right? Why Why do you think that? Oh, my. oh you have a question? Yeah, because of the monitor. The monitor is not turning up? Okay. I have to try with the computer? Yeah. Probably either connection or a mobile switch. 
I think it's probably selected under uh, HDMI instead of display port. <laughs> so any other questions? Okay. So today in the lab, we're going to see a little bit of the lockout policy. You can have a, them lock out for a certain amount of time. So basically that gives us time, right? So when somebody is brute forcing you after the five or 10, you're going to lock them out, right? That's the normal practice is after the five failed password, you're going to give them time out. Some company will be 30 minutes, right? And within that 30 minutes, right, their system is auditing those events. And we'll, we'll take a look at event viewer today, but a lot of times when we have a security management system, right, um, if they're brute forcing a lot of different accounts using bots, we should be able to pick that up and see which account, how many times that it failed or successfully gone through. So you need to do an audit on the account, but the threshold is really the maximum number of time that, that they can use the wrong password. So maybe five. Right. I normally use five. Some admin, they would use three. And I think three is a little bit more strict. And then the duration is just the amount of time that you're going to lock them out. OK. Um, we talked about using two step verification to multiple factor. Default password, I think these days that might not be important. You can just have them reset it out of the, the box. But when you create your account in Windows today, you have to you know, you, you should give in command prompt, you are required to put in the password. But in the graphical user interface, like your computer management console, you don't have to put in the password. So it really depends on what, what tool you're using to be able to do that. Okay. So you can pull the KBA information directly from six or summarize it. We talked about that. And then the dynamic knowledge base authentication. Can you hold that screen for a minute so I can type? Yeah. Please. And you can find that from the notes as well. So sometimes. They also use knowledge base authentication with your password. For example, when I logged in using a different device, I normally would use my smartphone to log on to a website to pay bills, for example. But another day I'm using my PC and it's recognizing that it's a different device or a different location. It would then prompt me with some security questions um, or, you know, background. And you see this also with credit checks, right? If you're applying for a credit card, it would use dynamic uh, knowledge base authentication where it wants to validate you based on like where you used to live, who you used to work for, et cetera, et cetera, right? It taught you those questions and where did they get all that information? A lot of it is public information, okay? Like your address. Things that you have completed on forms that you have submitted somewhere um, publicly and like at school or, or if you work for a public entity that has to be reported or kept. So it, there could be a lot of different use for both of these. We'll go with five. I'm going to move six down to the next page so we can see it together. So what we will do is we would create some form of policy, right? In the system, it sees those as rules. It's like how at home you would have a set of rules growing up or even now, if you have children or, or family members, you would say, uh, sometimes tell the kids, right? Don't talk to stranger. When you walk across the street, look both ways. So those are the things that were kind of innate in us over a period of time. For the system, it only understand the logic of the rules, right? Um, things like 
how many attempts before it locks the user out. And so the, the purpose of password policy is to really control how the user is inputting or issuing the password into the system. Like how many attempts they can, they can pursue. And also the type of password that they would see, like using password history. So for somebody would do passwords one, two, three, four, five, right? We can also control how complex of a password that they must create. So we can control a lot of the areas like the history. They cannot reuse the password over many times, right? Like maybe five different type of password until they can recycle it. And then the password length. How long is the password? So the common practice nowadays at this current time is still at least 12 characters, right? You go to most secure websites, they require 12 characters. Some are still working from eight and improving. Right, they would say eight to 10 characters. So when you do that, in security area or in the IT area, we configure to really support what is written, right? You would write it down on a document saying that all user must create these type of passwords, right? They cannot, you know, if you go over this many attempts, right, you will get locked out for 30 minutes, 24 hours, or however many. So those are the stated rules that the company set, and you would follow that up with the technical configuration. And I call that administration with uh, the, the administration that would tie with the security that would be technical. So you need to make sure that we configure to back up what's stated. So how can I how can I go and do this right? Um, later on in the lab, you would see that you will be able to do a group policy edit, and everything on Windows is searchable. So if you if you do um, now if you're using Windows Pro. Um, it would be able to show up here along with you can you can have the editor added. Right. See how I'm not using the pro on my laptop. But if I do switch the PC, you can search for group policy editor. And in that you would have account policy and security policy for the management. Then that's in Windows. Now in Linux, your all you have to do is you would control what the user can access as far as permission works, right? Um, read, write, execute, and so on. We saw a little bit of that during the first week. So question A, it says Mario is locked out on his account for 24 hours after five unsuccessful authentication attempts. What type of policies are applied to Mario's account? This is what's shown on your notes. We just looked this over. So the first part with the five attempts that's failed, the unsuccessful five attempts, that's account lockout threshold. Okay, the maximum value that you can issue, you can configure in the system that would check to see how many unsuccessful attempts that the user can issue the password. Then the account lockout duration is just the amount of time that they are going to be locked out for, right? You can have it one minute, 30 minutes, an hour, 24 hours. Really depends on what would the practice be for the organization. Now, if you lock them out for 24 hours, and if I started my day at 8 a.m. and I forgot my password because I just came back from vacation, then I'm locked out for 24 hours and my as well just go home, right? <laughs> so they would need to issue a service ticket to the technical, the IT department, and then they would be able to reset the password for that particular individual. 
So you can manually reset it. I'm gonna switch screen in a little bit so I can show you where you can find that information on, I should have brought my other laptop. And then we'll do question nine and then we'll take a look at where Windows would be. So Alma purchased a new Linksys wireless router for her home. The default user account is administrator and the password is admin. And this is common, right? What out of the box, what should Alma do to increase access security to her wireless router? So we should do this, not even some IT administrator don't always follow what we preach, right? We would always change the default username and password on the wireless router. Where do you find the control how to reach or create all the notes? Yes. But where, uh, what uh, title? Because the you... lockout policy? Is that that yes. Is? So out of the box, you might have a, a default username, right? And then once you go into the configuration, you would change that and change the password. Make sure we use complex password, passwords that would not be shared. Because the attacker, the first thing that they're going to do is they're going to try those things, right? Administrator. Now, for Windows OS, when you install Windows OS, right, does the administrator account exist? You never created the account. You install the OS. You go through the process. So I did that when I create your virtual machine. The administrator account is still where? It's not visible, right? You 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 can run things as administrator. You're gonna see some of that today. So Microsoft operating system decided that Microsoft decided that they would hide. Okay. So that means that you know when you boot it, unless you type in administrator, you won't see that option as a user because they don't have it where you can just click and log in. However, you know that the administrator account is there and the admin group is also in existence because you can add people to it if you want more control to certain resources. Okay. And then if you go into safe mode from for Microsoft, right, you will also see admin account. That's been around since, I don't know, Windows NT days in the 90s. Any question? Okay. So before we go into 10, I'm gonna... So this is your desktop, right? Um, we probably won't have privilege to this as the account, but what you can do is there are several ways that you can get to um, to do the control, right? We first talked about group policy editor. So as you can see, when it comes up with window, I think they're using the enterprise license here. So you would see that and it's gonna come back on the control panel. And I don't have access to this, but you will see it on the virtual machine, but it's gonna look something like this. We don't really have a, a way to manage this. So as a regular user, I should not have any kind of business in here, right? Does that make sense? Because if I'm the user and I'm going to start going in and changing up the rules for the system, then I can start adding myself to different things, right? It defeats the purpose of controlling the policy, okay? So you would use the, the group policy editor to be able to modify the rules on how what the system will allow you to access. Okay, so that's there. Um, another thing, you can probably see this. 
you can find the event viewer and it could also be part of computer management console. This is where all your activities are recorded. This is our world in security, right? A lot of times when you're trying to find issues, you will go here, right? Reading logs and trying to find out like who access what. So for incident response people, they're usually like the, the people that come in right after the bad things happen, right? They're like, as you can see, like the emergency worker. So you would go in and you would find things that would be related to security, right? Or the system itself. So when we're looking at this, see how all the things like when it gives warning, all the information, there's some error, right? I went over this with my CS25 before. So from availability standpoint, we want to look out for those error, but for the security, we don't have uh, access to this. But when you do the lab, you're going to see that it would audit successful and fail. So for someone who logs in, right, successfully, attackers, they don't just go around and just keep trying passwords, right? You have to you have to work fast and you have to work smart. And um, the good pen tester is going to be the one that's well trained, right? Uh, and I talked about this in 27B. So that means that you have to kind of know how the system is going to lay out and how to get to, to certain resources. So I don't just go and try to brute force the admin account, you know, a hundred and, uh, uh, you know, a thousand times because I'm going to get trapped here. The the one time that I'm going to log in, like for the, like, the, you know, Caesar Palace attack, the one time, because I know I only have about 12 or 15 minutes to move across the network because I already studied the network, I need to log in successfully. Okay, so this is why a lot of times security people don't detect this and they go under the radar because possibly that they also have inside information. Then a few months later, right, all the data is started to leak all over and they start finding public data information. They're like, oops, I think we'll breach now. So we'll probably have to go to PR and we'll we'll have to announce it and report it. Um, and that usually is what happened is you are reactive. And so when we come here, we're gonna try to find out, oh, they got into the system how, right? And then you go, you would go back months and, and, and days and see how often they get access to a certain server or a certain computer and so on. So the best thing that you can do is to look at logs, right? And then if you have an automated way to, to grep or filter your logs, that's great. But if you don't, you read one piece at a time <laughs> or you you read through the CSV file that your system cranked out. Any question? Okay, let's switch back. So for the credential policy, how would this apply to your end user? Okay. Compare that to your root user. So root users are the admin account in Linux system, right? Or administrator account or service accounts. Now, almost all systems would have some kind of service account. This is an account that the system use to be able to have lower access. So if you right click the, the files or the folder or the application properties and view its property, you're gonna see that like Windows would have some kind of account, like system to be able to access resources. So the end user, we would always apply the least privilege. You saw that I, as a regular user at RCCD, does not have any business in some of the IT administrative area, right? Even though I know how to, to use it, it doesn't mean that I should be in there because of my role. Now, if you assign the account by role in their organization, I was hired to be a faculty student. I wasn't hired to configure IT, so I should have access to only the resources for teaching. That will be by role. Now, sometimes you would have a rule base, right? Like your firewall would do that. 
So the 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 firewall system it will check what is allowed and what's not. So for example, I can set up my web application firewall to block all the IP address that would be public IP address that would be from China. So whenever, right, even if a user would be connecting to my web server from China, it will be blocked, for example. And that will be a rule. It, the, it either it does or it doesn't. Okay. For the root, the admin account, we would apply credential policy and the multi-factor authentication uh, because we want to make sure that they authenticate. So when when you are an admin in your organization, like a, a network admin, a system admin, right, you would get an account that would have higher privilege, but for that certain type of task, right? And then you would not log into the system administrator account or root. Now you saw in Linux, you can access root, root privilege by doing the sudo, but you still log in as tally. And then it's gonna always want to authenticate asking you for the password, right? So at home, you might be able to do run as administrator, but in organization, when you do run as administrator, it's gonna prompt you for the password for the credential, and possibly it's gonna issue some kind of um OTO TOTP type of, of code so that way it will validate and it's a text that's sent to an admin number. So we want to have credential policy and multi-factor. And then the service account, we want to use the appropriate privileges to apply credential, password, and lockout policy. A lot of the times when you have service account for automated systems, so for example, I might have a computer that control other computers. So a lot of the, the script that's written in, we normally just plug in the password and it just sends the script. So for example, I might have a computer that turns off all the air conditioning unit at maybe 7 a.m. in the morning at a school like this, right? And the controller itself, sometimes you have to put in a pin or whatever, and in an automated environment, a system admin or, or a technician, they can just write a script, right? Toggle that signal on, right, to generate that signal, and then it asks for a pin, so so if else condition, plug this string in, one, two, three, four, five, right? And all the controller might have the same type of pin so that way they can service it easily and that can be done. And it could be for computer to computer and computer to you know, manufacturing systems or other things. So you gotta make sure that you have appropriate privilege and also apply credential. We don't wanna have just a shared password across all the controller and then the lockout policy. But that sometimes can be more work for the technical people and the engineers, but hey, guess what, right? Either you are working or your companies can be down for months or years because we've been at attack. Any question? We want to disable guest account. I think the cool thing about the OS nowadays is it turns it off. Your wireless network at home, you have to make sure that your wireless disable the guest account, right? Um, now, if you use the guest account, just make sure that you put an expiration on it. That means that I can turn it on for, uh, I don't know, an hour, two hours. So whenever that you have visitors that come to your network, you can use that account temporarily and they're gonna have limited internet access anyways. So they can access websites and things, but then they can't do much. Uh, the same thing with the guest account on the system, okay? I would stray away from using guest account, right? I know that they enable the guest account on these computers for you guys. Um, but for practice, we usually don't. And it should be only temporary. So when you get this question on the cert, you know that guest account is, should be disabled or it's very limited and temporary. So that means talking minutes and hours, right? 
not weeks and days. So for the guest network, we can enable it for a short period of time and then turn that off for the wireless side. So when a person leaves the organization, should I disable the account or should I delete the account? Let's say that someone is fired and they're, I know for sure they're not coming back. Right, John Doe got fired. Should I disable the account or should I remove the account? Disable. disable the account. How so? Why? Because it's illegal. Right, because you might have a lawsuit waiting to happen or already in the works, right? Um, we, we will have to go back and see. Uh, maybe he's leaking data, maybe he's committing fraud, or maybe he, just, he was just a good worker and he found a better job somewhere else and he's not coming back, right? So, but some of his data might be useful to the next person who's in that role. So if he's working on a project or something, as an administrator to that system, we would be able to access his account. Also, Right, you have you might have this one employee that encrypt all the data before they leave because they know that they are the creator owner. When you create that file, you own that file, right? You have full access to that file. Okay. And then I'm not getting a raise, so forget it. I'm just gonna encrypt everything and then quit. What are they gonna do to me? Right. Well, my manager can't access it. But the system admin can go and they have a shadow key. So you will go in and recover that encrypted file and you are the only one that's going to be able to decrypt outside of that creator or that person. And that happens too. They delete files, right? So that if that happens to you, so let's say that Jane Doe decided to delete the files because she didn't get a raise. Right. Then how can I recover the file? Well, you go pull your backup from a few days ago or yesterday and then be able to get the file, even if she deleted. So technically in a really good network environment, even if you delete things like on social media, nothing is really deleted, right? Things can be backed up multiple times and that can be pulled. Okay, I'm gonna come back to the notes a little bit just to make sure that we, so here we talked about end user personal admin service account. We touched a little bit on that. And then the next section on page four, it touches on PAM. Privilege access management. And this is for privilege account management allows organization to apply stringent security control accounts with escalated privileges such as admin or root account. Okay, so it should be that the administrator does not have the highest privileges when it is not needed. Why? I'm the admin to the network or the system. I should have access to everything all at once, right? So someone can impersonate me and access my account. So you got to be careful with the administrator account. So even... As the administrator, they should have a regular user account for most of their tasks. The only time that they need to access the admin account is only when it's necessary, okay? And then even for the other technician, we can put them in groups and, and that would correlate with their roles and control those groups. So I suggest using group membership and controlling the group to elevate the privilege. Okay. You can also have a person that's in separate groups, two separate groups, right? So they would inherit. So like, let's say that I have Jane Doe. She's also, when I first create her account, that she's in user group. Then she's also in the manager group because she's a manager, right? And then I can also throw her into administrator because she's an IT manager, 
But the challenge with that using that one single account is because once Jane Doe account is breached, guess what happens? They're able to access different areas, okay? So you kind of have to be careful about how you're looking at that role and what kind of access. So normally I start with an inventory of the user, a list of, you know, 100, 5,000 people, depends on how large the company is. And then I would map that each account to whatever the task. So you would start with what do they need to do on a daily basis? A cash register? Oh, they just need to put in their access code, scan the item, right? Do the product possibly, but they don't have an override code. You see this. Whenever that they need an override, they need that key at the cash register. Right? I install many cash registers, so I, I'm familiar with the process. Or they need a certain pin code to really activate that override code. So the manager, which is in a different group, to be able to do that. And then their manager is in a different group to be do that. So when you group nest, sometimes elevated privilege can creep. That means that they can move from one area to the next. You just got to be really careful, okay? Making sure that they're changing password. They're protecting against uh, things that would be protected against attacks. And then we need to log all access credential. There's not a time. So the attacker, the smart attacker will do what? What would they do? Once I access and I can be traced, what would I do next? Once I'm in and then I, I find what? The logs and delete it, right? Does that make sense? If it's tracking me, I, I delete it so you can't find me. And this is what happens that happens over months and days until sometime they get audited and they're like, oh, so-and-so was in here. One system doesn't track it because they delete the log on one system, but they might not delete the log on another. And that's how you can find some information. Okay. So... For PAM, it is useful in controlling system because it's going to limit time, as in time to access resources, the privileges at the highest level of the user to prevent escalation of privileges. So escalation of privileges in the cybersecurity world means what? I am a user, right? A regular user, maybe in the employee group but I can elevate myself to be an admin or a power user at some point, perhaps knowing someone's password or perhaps because, you know, there's mistake in configuration. So from an external entity standpoint, an attacker coming in, they're going to try to go in as some, something that's not detected, maybe a regular user. And if they're able to, to do a fish phone call, right? A spirit phishing, call up certain people in IT and find out some information, then they can just get a, a password to, to a technical account and then be able to access it. This is why phishing is gonna be, you know, it's it's usually is the biggest goal for us to fix. Question. So to reduce risk for up the unauthorized user accessing, we want to have the administrator use the regular user account, right? So that way we would avoid escalation of privilege or escalation of attacks. And some, most of the attackers, they would find leave things so that way they can come back and access. So if the account, it could be detected, they would, if they have the privilege to do that, they would create another account or, you know, add some account that they would be able to access into certain membership and then be able to come back with that account. So I've seen cases where they create a account across a lot of different systems and it's difficult to detect. Um, especially there was one company that I've worked with, the developer account is shared. And then so that way they can service the application. So that was the problem to start with. So that's how they were able to change things. Um, 
Any question? Okay. And you notice we put reduced risk, right? We can never really remove that risk. Okay, so do not share account. I know that sometime manufacturing or you know things like that, they have a generic account. We don't use generic account. Everything needs to be logged and traced, okay? You have to know who's who because if you lump everybody up into one account, fraud can be committed and you won't be able to track it, okay? Even on shipping and receiving, someone can ship themselves goods and you won't know, right? Um, print their own checks and send it to their home. That's been done before. Many things. So you want to know when they logged in, right? What they access and everything needs to be accountable. Okay. Whenever that the account is no longer used, you need to have a set of rules for that, right? Did we disable the account? How do we handle the data? How long is the data retained? Is that going to match up with regulation and accreditation and all of those entity, right? When you terminate employees, disable as soon as possible. Sometimes you might have people escort them out of the building in some cases, right? Um, for leave of absence, you also need to disable for a certain period of time. And then whoever that's a temporary worker for this person, you would create their own account, right? Do not allow them to use the person in leave account because, you know, who knows what could happen. Um, you don't want to delete the account because of files that are related to that account. We can also restrict account with time-based login. You've seen this. So a lot of the times it's like for short-term services and things. Um, they would give you access to the system for a certain period of time. And then also limited access. Some of you will be doing this part down the line. Uh, I've had many students that that's how they start writing policy and audit. But you can become, uh, I'll, talk, I'll show you where you can find some resources to become a national auditor an external auditor that will be on the list. So whenever a company needs you, but with that, you have to understand how to do risk assessment and with assessment, you have to know how to do pen testing. Um, but you can do account audit. Basically, it just check every single account. Some of my apprentices now, since they've been working for a while, they deem this to be boring, <laughs> right? But hey, if you can get paid a lot of money doing this, all day long, right? Sometimes additional stimulation is making the job a little bit more fun, but hey. Okay, um, we talked about 13, so let's move this down a little bit. And then for 14, why should organizations avoid allowing shared generic account? We touched on because it does not provide accounting details, who, what, when something occurs in the case of an incident. Someone can go in and delete a bunch of files. That is a shared account. We won't know who did it. We would see when that account was accessed and what kind of object was accessed and deleted, but we won't know, right? Maybe if you have physical camera system, you might be able to see. But in a lot of these things, when you present it to the legal, you know, the legal side of the house, when you take it to court, right? You have to have multiple things presented. You can't just say, oh, my log shows that so-and-so was in here at this time to access that, right? Because the attorney, they're gonna argue that. How accurate is your log? When was your system service? Who can tell, how can we tell that you didn't call to find your law, right? To really incriminate this individual. So there, there would be many things. So you have to have like pretty much a layout of all the things, right? Oh, my camera system show that, you know, this person show up, they pull up with this vehicle, they enter this door, the log on the door, you know, he scanned his card, 
clear and you know and some of that pulls back into forensic and even if they delete the logs we should be able to have that kind of record <laughs> where can we find things that are deleted okay now in incident response you you do have to know a little bit of forensic Forensic is not something that a lot of security people jump on to do because it requires a lot of time and a lot of, you know, just working things through. So if you are patient and you like, you know, it is rewarding when you're finding something cool, but it does take a lot of time and, and effort, okay? If you like that thing to, to really get into forensic, it is highly demanded. Okay, so we talked about the accounts that should be disabled, guests, terminated employees, on leave account, accounts that are no longer should be used. Okay, I have audited companies that people have not been there for years and the account is still there, right? So doing inventory and, you know, removing... When you, over a period of time, sometimes company will allow you to delete the account. So let's say that they want to retain that account for so many years and they would have that stated in the policy. Then well, after that, you would go in. Okay. So when you do audit, basically that's a go back to review. So when you auditing, Sys for, for your system, you would review permissions and privileges to make sure that we are following the least privilege principle, only allow that is necessary. And then prevent privilege creep. So that just means that you, I think I, yeah, privilege creep. Any question? Oops, sorry. I'm not in this So we want to know the answer, how we want to remember it. You can summarize it. You don't have to put it verbatim when we talked about that last time. So a lot of times you would have, you know, window system that's being used for authentication. Um, even though they might have used other servers or other space. So for example, I'm going to take RGB and all of these RGB system, right? Whatever that you logged on to your student account to access the email or your payments or whatever, your credential is being validated through Windows system, Active Directory. Active Directory is a role that the server holds to store. It's like a database of all the subjects and the objects that are accessing that network environment. I'm talking object as in, it could be a printer, right? As in subject, as in you or group of students. So when you register for school, when you fill out the form, once that form is generated, they have an automated system where your account is created, right? Or you can have the user self-enroll in most cases for the web environment like social media, you self-enroll, you create your user account. And then to validate who you are every time you issue your password, it would go through authentication system. And that authentication system is usually tied to the DNS and the web server if it is web, web front, right? So with that, we will have to really refer back to, okay, how secure is Windows authentication? 
So the mechanism in Windows is within, for authentication is within Active Directory. And this is basically, like I said, a database that would contain user accounts, groups, and objects. In Unix environment, that will be realms. And it uses, for Kerberos, it uses the key distribution center for ticketing, granting packages. So it's very much like this, right? Um, you buy season pass to this land, you pay the fee, they give you some kind of access to various things. Sometimes you have to pay for like parking, but you have access to a certain part of the land. So in order to, to use your season pass, Maybe they send you a wristband. I don't have season pass in this land. I'm just assuming, right? And you would use it to take your kids, your family to the park. And based on the wristband, they know that you have this type of season pass where compared to a VIP season pass, for example. So the system, it does two things. Number one, it's going to give you some it's going to give you the, it uses the key distribution center to validate, right? Your authentication based on your certificate. Okay. And that's going to really control how your token, your security token, your, your security agent is going to be communicating with the rest of the network and the internal system. Second, it's going to do a ticketing granting packages. Think of it like when you're getting granting a ticket, think of it like the wristband that you use to access certain resources in the amusement park. It's going to really be able to identify the privilege, the level of access based on that ticket that's being granted. So these are some of the features that integrated the roles that the server play when it's checking your authentication. How can I be able to identify that user compared with the next, right? What kind of level that what user one compared to the user two is to have these components that's integrated with Active Directory. So when you send, Active Directory is gonna say, oh, I'm gonna try to match you up to see if your password match. Once your password match, let's send it over to KDC and to Ticket Granting Center. And that's gonna really control right, your privilege level. And then once that happens, oh, okay, so here's your token. That's your wristband to the, the, to the park or your system, right? So it's gonna determine what kind of wristband you have using those, those components with Active Directory, okay? So think of Active Directory as like, it has a list of all the customers that purchase the annual pass or the season pass, right? And then with that, it would validate like how much you pay. If you pay this much, this is the 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 pass that you're gonna get using KDC and uh, and uh, the ticket the the TGC. I will show you a little bit of the certificate certificate side um toward the end on how to configure some of this, but this itself, I think it you know if you take forty C. Uh, it's a Windows class that really address some of this on the server. Okay. So single sign-on is great. We use it here, right? You can log into one app and once you log in, you are authenticated with the other app. You can also sign in with Google, Facebook, or whatever, right? Basically, your credential is passed. Now, if you're doing sign-in with Google and Facebook, it uses a technology called open off, right? And that is a way that we would be able to take the credential that we use from one company and share it with another company. It's, it's using that particular service and there are certain protocols that share. So the benefit of that is definitely it's user-friendly, it's convenient streamline a lot of the processes for the user. On the technical 
administration side, it's definitely going to reduce some workload for us because we don't have to reset password all the time, right? Um, ask people are forgetting passwords and so on or getting locked out. So we don't have to unlock a lot of the accounts. The drawback is that the credential can fall into the wrong hands and, you know, you, there could be that the account is being attacked, right? Someone can impersonate, someone can perform a man in the middle. They can also do a session hijack by using session ID. So attacks can per be performed to jeopardize the organization through that account with single sign-on. So if I'm an, an executive, I might be prone to that because I have higher level access. So the purpose of the least privileges in control is to really allow the user or to add the user to the to the to allow the user rights and permissions needed to perform the task and the function. So that's kind of coming back to some of the, the questions that's asked earlier. So least privilege is we're only gonna allow them that's needed to work or to operate. And overall, that will reduce the risk in our networks or domains. Because internal threats can be very hard to detect. Sometimes if you give them additional privileges, they might be able to perform other things, right? Commit fraud and that would be difficult to, to find. So for permission control, when you're using Windows system, you can refer to NTFS. NTFS permission control for security reasons, right? Um, you can add the user to the group, then we would be able to use computer management console to, to do those things. Then we would add that group to the, the object properties and control the permission based on that. So for example, I have this folder, right, called unit two. I can right click the folder and I can go to its properties. In Windows system that uses NT file system, you would have this tab called security tab. This was integrated mostly during uh, Windows XP era that was many decades ago. And so with this, this is known as access control list. You would have the ob the subject and how it should be accessing the object, right? So as you can see here, the authenticated users, they're able to modify, that means change, right? Read and execute, see the content inside the folder. Read is to view a particular object like a file and then write, right, to save. So now there, there are not special permissions that's granted. So if, if I'm logged on as authenticated user to that system, I'm allowed to do these things. Whenever that you deny, oh, usually overrides what's allowed. So for example, if I deny write, right, or list content, it's gonna override some of the other related area that requires those things that's allowed. So if I deny read, right, likely that they cannot write without read. Like who's gonna be able to save the file if it cannot see the file, right? So 
there are some overlapping permissions and so and this is sometimes is a fall down so you have to do inventory for this too so we here we would see that the admin is different they have everything allowed now you can deny a certain group so when you do deny all right it overrides everything for that particular object and then there's users so the authenticated users have higher level in permission compared to the users on the system, right? I can do a read and execute, list content and view, okay? The regular users don't have the write or the modify. That means that I, they cannot modify the object. They cannot change it and save it. Compared to the authenticated users, you would have more permissions, right? Then you have to find out who's in the authenticated users. So your group membership to the users is specific. The service account, here it is. Usually you would see that it has full control. And that's the same for most standard Windows system, right? So as an attacker, they would look at who are added to a certain object. So let's say that this is a drive that contain a lot of designs and things like that. And the drive property is going to be similar to this, where it is a container of files, right? It's going to say, oh, well, authenticated users have a little bit more. They can change and modify. Likely that that's going to track me as well. So I'm coming in as this. I just need to make sure I add myself to that group, right? And now I have privilege creeping. So me, for example, my name is Tom. I, I My account is Tom. I'm in this group, right? I just got to make sure that I find ways to add myself to that group or have access to the user from that group. So as you can see, the property sheet of the object, that's your NTFS permission on the system. Now in Linux, when we did the exercise we're doing the first week, right? You look at the permission, you need ch mod to change your permission for the user, the group, right? For your text file, we did that for exercise one. And Windows system also have shared permission. Share permissions are less. It's, you can control how that resource or that object is shared with other users. It's read, write, and execute. Very similar to what you've seen with Linux permissions. Now, share permissions can be used, but if you can control everything with security for the NTFS permission in Windows system, that's much better. We'll have some practice with permission down the line. What should the administrator do to manage the account and reduce risk when Teresa, payable account manager, is on medical leave? We already know that we should disable the her account. And then the temp worker in her place, we would create another account for that person. That could be temporary. You can also have that account is expire when that person leaves and then reactivate Teresa's account when we come back. And then who can recover the disabled account? We know that that would be the admin or the designated person, but you have to assign that person the group membership to do that. So by default, administrators. And this is lengthy, so I'm, you know, let me move 22 down to the bottom or the next page. Okay. If you have a couple of minutes there, any questions? So, certification questions, a lot of times are going to be through scenario based questions for the multiple choice one and then you're going to do some performance space and I try to address that with your hands-on exercises right like your lab but we need to make sure 
that when someone asks us or when we think about those things, it needs to be your second nature, okay? And that takes time and practice, right? I started like you. I just I was just interested in working in IT because number one, it pays. Number two, I love building computers. <laughs> I still do. Um, so I was just interested in it through that, right? And and that's how my career really got started. One of my friends said, you know, if you work in this field, like find job easy and be cost is like good money. So okay. I said, oh, what what does it take? And they said, oh, you just have to like computers. And that's, you know, back in the days, you didn't have to have credential or anything. You kind of have to know and a little bit by just learning. Um, formal training, maybe not so much, right? And so just tinkering around with things, you kind of taught yourself a lot of things. And then, you know, I eventually found boxes that I could take and so on. But practice, right? Make sure that you're familiar right, with the term. Some student has certification, high flying color, and then when they interview for jobs and when they show up, they have a hard time. They struggle with actually doing the work, right? I, I get the story because sometimes they would talk to me about it and say, you know, the first couple of months, it was really hard because I'm trying to remember things that I've learned in such and such class. I said, but well, you know, it's like you have to make sure that you keep, keep remember, you got to oil that machine because otherwise you're not going to, you're not going to know how to do things. Okay, any question? Okay, let's move on. It's almost, we're almost done. Okay, we talked about who can recover. So some example, just to kind of sum it up and not make it crazy long, we talked about role-based already, and it's often um, shortened as rollback. So role-based access control, and that will be related to the job title or the function. And human resource department, usually they will tell you the responsibility Right, the role, for example, you might not know all the, the individual roles of organization, you're not expected to. So they would give you a list of the description of the job, their responsibilities. You just need to map out the responsibilities to objects, right? Your system, like applications, and so on. So normally take that role and write down the list of application in the organization that that person would use, at what level, can they configure the application, yes or no, what kind of modification they can do to the application, you know, for example, like browser. Simple things, right? A browser as an application, you would assume that in this day and age, most people would say, okay, most account won't be able to access the internet. And that can go either way for some company. They might not want the employee to surf the internet while bringing up customer. Okay. Or package shipping or manufacturing because they are they need to see and focus on, you know, maybe whatever process that would be on screen or right in front of them, right? So we have to disable that functionality for the application for the user. If you ask me, I wouldn't even put the shortcut there for, for that account, right? You can customize their desktop because the less they see, the less they access. That's my way. But some admin, they would still keep the shortcut there because, you know, my, why customize? desktop for many groups where you can just have one desktop. And that's really streamlining some of the processes and I understand, but when you put a folder in front of someone or a shortcut or an icon, they likely will click it. And then you can control the application to the access token for that user. The rule base, we touched on this already, setting up the rules, right? What port numbers, what type of protocol, yes or no on this, right? IP address block, yes or no, allow, disallow, right? 
And we can do whitelisting and blacklisting. Black is when we're black, and whitelisting is when we're black. Uh, I have one favorite, please. Sure. I'd like to go to number eight, but I missed that. Yeah, hold on one second. I think they're still typing this, so we'll come back to those. And then discretionary, your DAC is owner implement. So it's like you own your land and you can do whatever you want with your land, right? You can let people live there, not let people live there, build your houses, whatever mansion. Okay. So DAC is like that. It's the owner discretion. So when I create the object, like my file, I can share it to whoever I wish or not share right? Creator ownership. And that's default. So a lot of the things that we do in real life, you're going to see that it's relayed in system uh, properties and characteristics because we built the computer to mimic us, to be like us, right? Hence AI now. And then your mandatory access control. That's like how you would have different tier that would tie to label like top secret, you know, secret, private, and so on. And we'll come back to uh, data classification with this. So that would match up with what the user could access. A lot of the time um, you see this being implemented. A good example is with the government agencies. And then they declassify certain type of data where the public could access, where there's top secret data, only certain group of people can access. So that's considered a mandatory access control model. And then attribute ba base. So that would be defined based on some rules um, specific to certain type of sites. So this would be software defined. That means you can configure in the software to allow the user to access certain things. You see this in gaming or other applications. Now, can you have both? Most of the time in organization, you have all of these in different areas or sometime in one not all, but overlapping. Okay. Are we okay with this? So we're expected to know these models for access. We need to know all the factors. We talked about um, the AAA and so on. Okay. So go back and read the notes. If you have the book, you can do that. Okay. So Gabriel asked for question A. Sure. Okay, any question? All right, save your work on your USB. Don't forget to take your USB later. Uh, you can take a little bit of a break if you need restroom break. They do lock it like after 8.30. So um, take the restroom break, get some snacks. If you wanted to power through, right, you can grab a drive, copy the folder onto your desktop because I want in case things happen to your virtual machine, you have the one on the drive in that to as a backup. And then I'll walk you through that. Let me stop recording. Sorry, one second. Okay.